in the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful, peace be upon you. Welcome to another episode of From the Desk of Gamdi. Our series on the 23 questions continues, and today we begin the 139th episode. Today's discussion focuses on what is hadith. This is our fifth session on this topic. Let's get started. Ramdi Sahab, thank you for joining us today. Ramdi Sahab, we have three core questions to address. What is the chronological history of hadith? Starting with the Prophet, peace be upon him, we've now reached the era of the Rashidun Caliphs. I'd like you to continue from there and delve into the three questions regarding the recording, verbal transmission, and those who transmitted them. What was the method of their verification and investigation? What was the common practice among the other companions? What progression did we observe from earlier attitudes? How did these attitudes evolve over time? We analyze the era of the Rashidun Caliphs. You're correct in noting that three key points were clarified during this period, and we observed how Caliph Abu Bakr adopted a certain approach, as well as the practices of Caliph Umar. What about the other two Caliphs? We've shared what information we had, and now we'll examine how other companions approached documenting the Hadith. As for documentation, the Hadiths were written down and two viewpoints emerged regarding this. One view was that it was an eternal directive, so anything other than the Qur'an attributed to the Prophet was not to be written. The second viewpoint saw this as a temporary measure, considering the Qur'an was being compiled and people were still memorizing it, hence the directive was given. If we achieve complete satisfaction with this, there is no harm in documenting it. The knowledge is there, its memorization and further dissemination through writing are natural processes, and if there is a practice to the contrary, then that might be a basis for argument. I want to note that these two perspectives also existed among the companions, like we saw with Caliphs Abu Bakr and Umar. We get a glimpse of this during the time of Caliph Muawiyah. I'll cite a hadith, number 3644 from Abu Dawud. It goes, Dakala Zaid ibn Sabitin ala Muawiyah. Zaid ibn Thabit was a prominent figure among the Ansar companions, remembered especially for compiling the Qur'an. He visited Muawiyah, may God be pleased with him. Fasalahu an hadith. He inquired about a hadith which perhaps had been reported by Muawiyah. Wanting confirmation, he went directly to him. Fa amara insanan yaktubuhu. Muawiyah instructed someone to write it down for Zaid. Zaid could have heard it verbally, but he was told that since it was attributed to him, it could be given to him in writing. فَقَالَ لَهُ زَيْدِ Upon hearing this, Zaid said, إِنَّ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ أَمَرَانَ أَلَّا نَكْتُبَ شَيْءٍ مِنْ حَدَّسِهِ فَمَعَهُ The Prophet, peace be upon him, had directed us not to write anything attributed to him. Okay. Clearly, he was a distinguished companion, and his relation with the Prophet was extraordinary, so the written material was erased. This illustrates the strong presence of both viewpoints among the companions. That is, Muawiyah felt no hesitation in writing it down, but a companion like Zaid ibn Thabit insisted it could not be written. Thus, it seems he viewed it as a perpetual directive. With this, we can understand the general attitudes of the companions. Some believed nothing should be written, while others thought differently, as we discussed with regard to the caliphs Abu Bakr and Umar. And now we see Caliph Muawiyah's perspective that it was a precautionary directive. Considering certain factors, this directive had been issued. Now, if those concerns no longer exist, it's acceptable to write down the hadiths. We find that some companions began to document them. The need to write arises from various factors as you write down knowledge for your own memory, sometimes to advise or to transmit knowledge to family members, or in this case, a question about a hadith arose, so Muawiyah instructed it to be written down. Thus, the practice of writing had started among those who saw no harm in it. They considered it a specific situation where this directive was issued. Now that the Book of God is secured, the final recitation of the Quran has been done, it has been published, and publicized, therefore, there is no harm in writing them down. I'll tell you 
that historical narratives tell us that a large number of companions had written down hadiths. This is from Azmi, and I am quoting from his research in the book Al Jamul Kamil. He states, "Wakat sabata anna aksara min kamsina sahabian katabul hadith." It is established that more than 50 companions had written down their own hadiths. That is, someone had written two or four or ten or some had written even more than this. Such collections existed, including those minhuman kataba fi hayatin Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam who had written during the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him. We know that Abdullah bin Amr bin As had done so, which was later erased. Similarly, it is mentioned about Anas bin Malik, kana yubrizu az ishtiman nas. He had a manuscript, so when people gathered, he would present it and show it to them. It is said that Ali ibn Abi Talib also had written material with him. And the same is said about Amr bin Hazim. So this was during the lifetime of the Prophet, peace be upon him. Then he states, وَمِنْ هُمْ مَنْ كَتَبَ بَعْدَ وَفَاتِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ And more than 50 companions mentioned also include those who had written after the departure of the Prophet, peace be upon him. That is, people kept writing something or the other. However, none could be preserved in such a way that it could have reached us. Why couldn't the earlier ones reach us? We have already explained that the Prophet himself had directed them to be erased. It's quite clear about later periods that people generally believed they could record them for their memory. Or they could pass it on to their students, but it wasn't suitable to organize them into an orderly text. We've seen that the practice of both Caliphs Umar and Abu Bakr had been quite strict. Hence, it's understandable why it did not transmit onwards even if more than 50 people had written it. This, among the companions, was the situation about writing it. Now, let's consider its verbal narration. We know that the last prophet of God had not applied any restriction with regard to its verbal transmission. However, extreme caution was maintained in this regard by both caliphs Abu Bakr and Umar. We had presented instances of their preventing any mix-up with the Qur'an. Let the people remain focused on the Qur'an. Narrate something only when it is necessary, as they too had done, it shouldn't become rampant. And this went to the extent that they barred some renowned companions and stopped them from narrating hadith. And he observed their tendency to narrate excessively to people. So this strictness existed. I've said that this gradually became more lenient. That is, in the times of Caliph Uthman, and later in the times of Caliph Ali. However, generally, two groups existed among the companions. One group, which we call Muqsirin among us. They had adopted the same attitude that is. They possessed knowledge. They took whatever precautions were necessary. Now we should transmit this knowledge to people. If this relates to the life, incidents or battles or manners of the Prophet, or likewise, it is the knowledge or the jurisprudence of the Prophet, then it should be communicated to people. And on the other hand, the attitude we saw in Caliphs Abu Bakr and Umar also existed. Thus, the knowledge that we have regarding both these perspectives I am presenting here now. First of all, you should see that the people among the companions who thought that we should not state hadiths excessively, that is, their point of view was that adoption of minimality is best for it. It should be bare minimum, only as per the need. It isn't something which we start narrating as and when we wish. There are various risks involved in it. Who are those companions? They are very renowned companions. Just see, first of all, I will read to you the narration of Amir bin Abdullah bin Zubair. He is reporting it from his father, that is, who is the father? It is Sayyidna Zubair. He was among the closest of the companions of the Prophet. And he is the one who was considered among the leaders of Muslims in those times. He says, Kultu liz Zubair. I said this to Zubair, may God be pleased with him. Mali la asmauka tu hadisu an Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How is it that the way I see Ibn Masood, may God be pleased with him, and so and so state narrations attributing to the Prophet, I do not find you doing that? Mali la asmauka tu hadisu. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
كما أسماء ابن مسعود وفلانا وفلانا قال أما إني لم أفارق منذ أسلمت ولكن سميت منه كلمة من كذاب علي متمدا ليدل به الناس فليتبوى مكده من النار That is, what did he ask? He had asked the reason why other companions narrate a lot while I do not see you doing it. He replied, Son, since the time I have become a Muslim, I wasn't away from the Prophet. I am one of his closest companions. However, the reason why I fear is due to a pronouncement of the Prophet. The Prophet had said, To mislead the people, if someone knowingly narrates something wrong in attribution to me, then he would find his dwelling in hell. We can guess from it that Siedna Zubair too must be possessing a lot of narrations, and he must have heard a lot many things from the Prophet. However, he didn't find it proper to narrate them. He did narrate a few things. However, he mostly tended to be silent. What is the reason? He himself says that it involves a lot of risk. This is the reason which Caliph Abu Bakr had stated that lest anything in attribution to the Prophet is stated of which he could not bear responsibility in the hereafter. This narration is from Musnad Ahmed and its number is 14 and 13. Following this, look at another narration. It is reported by Anas bin Malik. We have taken it from Sahih Bukhari and its number is 108. Anas bin Malik narrates, Innahu la yamnawni anu hadisakum hadisan kasira anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal man ta'amada alayya kaziba fal yatabawwa makadahu minan nar Anas, may God be pleased with him, narrates that the thing which stops him from excessively reporting things attributed to the Prophet, you see, his approach is that of minimality, like Caliph Umar used to expect. The thing which stops him from narrating excessively is the saying of the Prophet, whoever purposely assigns something false to me should find his dwelling in hell. He cites the same reason. Now listen about Caliph Uthman. The narration which I am reading to you is from Musnad Etialsi and its number is 80. يقول Usman ibn Affan Wallahi ma yamnawni an uhaddisa an rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam anni la akunu aw ahum li hadisihi walakin ashadu anni sami'ituhu يقول من قال علي ما لم أقول فليتبوى مكده من النار Caliph Uthman states By God, what prevents me from narrating the words of the messenger is not that I do not remember much of his sayings as compared to others. That is, it is not that I have forgotten. Hmm, after all he's a Rashidun Caliph. I have been his companion day in and day out. I too remember a lot of things. And rather the reason is that I have heard the Prophet and I bear witness to the Prophet saying, whoever attributes something which I did not say, he may well find his dwelling to be in hellfire. This gives an idea that there were many people among the companions who were aware of this narration. And based on this, it can be said that the Prophet had given this warning repeatedly. Therefore, the close companions were quite aware of it. Now just listen to a narration of Abu Qatada. This is taken from Musnad Ahmed, and its number is 22538. The narration is, he said, Samitu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqul ala haza al-minbar ya ayyuha al-nas iyaakum wa kasrat al-hadisi anni man qala alayya fala yaqulanna illa haqqa aw sidqa fa man qala alayya ma lam aqul fal yatabawwa makadahu minan nar. It is stated by Abu Qatada, may God be pleased with him, that he has heard the Prophet saying on this pulpit, it gives an idea that on some pulpit, that is, in some sermon, or on some occasion when people were assembled, the Prophet stated this point, and it is possible that he might have stated it more than once. He heard him saying on the pulpit, O people, be wary of narrating too much from me. With this, we also come to know that it was the warning of the Prophet, that there shouldn't be excess in stating narrations, and which was later adopted by Caliph Umar as well as Caliph Abu Bakr too. Whoever narrates attributing something from me should be true and just. That is, if it needs to be said or narrated, however, you should make it absolutely sure that the point is fully true and just. As anybody who falsely attributes something to me and which I did not say, 
he should find his dwelling in hell. Post this, now see Abu Sa'id Khudri, may God be pleased with him. This narration has been reported by him in Musnad de Abi Yala, and its number is 1209. He says, Anna Rasulallahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqala haddisu anni wala haraj, haddisu wala takzibu alayya, wa man kazaba alayya mutammidan, faqad tabawwa makadahu minan nar. The same point described from a different angle. The Messenger of God stated, Narrate my words, there is no harm in it. This is the same what we have said earlier too. State them, however, do not dare to attribute a lie to me. Remember, whoever does attribute a lie knowingly, he has made his dwelling in hellfire. The warning is the same. The Prophet drew attention, sometimes from a pulpit or sometimes through other means, that led the companions to automatically develop an attitude that we cannot state these things in such a manner. And it is the knowledge given by the Prophet, and it is his seerah, there cannot be any restriction applied to its narration. However, caution, care to make sure, although one point is fully obvious by the total attitude, that there isn't any risk of losing some aspect of the deen. It constitutes knowledge, while the deen has been contained in the Quran and Sunnah. Listen to the last narration in this chain. This is the narration of Abu Musa Ghafiq. May God be pleased with him. We have picked this narration from Musnad Ahmed and its number is 18946. The narration is Anna Abu Musa al Ghafiqi Samia Uqbata, Abna Amir, Al Johani Yuhadisu al Al Mimbar, and Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a hadith Fakala Abu Musa inna Sahibakum, Hazala Hafizun Aw Halik. إن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم كان آخر ما أهد إلينا أن قال عليكم بكتاب الله وسترجون إلى قوم يحبون حديث أني فمن قال علي ما لما قل فليتبوى مكاده من النار ومن حافظ أني شيء فليحدث أبو موسى غافق may God be pleased with him heard from another companion Uqba bin Amir Johani may God be pleased with him while attributing it to the Prophet heard him saying on the pulpit, that is, one companion is hearing another companion. So he said, is your colleague a Hafiz or does he wish to be destroyed? If he is a Hafiz, that is, he has memorized everything in an exceptional manner which makes him recount so confidently, or does he wish to be destroyed? The last will that the Prophet had told us was to make the Book of God binding upon us. That is, I have given the book to you and I have said that the Sunnah had been issued, and it has also been continuing historically as well. Make the Book of God binding upon yourself, and soon you would reach people who would like to narrate my anecdotes. That is, they would love for you to recount my tales and stories, and tell them about how I appeared to you, if I have taught some knowledge, or if I had made any innovative application of a principle, or if it was a point of jurisprudence from me that they would love to hear. I have said earlier that this is a natural demand. That is, the people who had seen the Prophet, when we would meet them, what would you and I do? We would wish that he say something about the Prophet. The Prophet stated, Soon you would be going towards such people who would love to state about me. So remember that whoever attributes something towards me, and which I did not say, he should make his dwelling in hell. However, those who have memorized my narrations well, he may do so if he wishes to. That is, there is no prohibition in reporting from the Prophet. However, it requires extraordinary caution. Obviously, when such an extreme precaution is emphasized, what attitude will this give birth to among careful people? That is, they either report minimally or not to report them at all. With this, the fact becomes quite clear that the level to which the people had been alerted and warned. Therefore, most of the companions adopted an attitude of caution. But contrary to it, I have said that some companions were of the perspective that we do possess a certain knowledge. Caution, no doubt, is good. We should be careful, however, if we are satisfied that the point is clearly remembered, we have understood and stating it rightly, and not committing any mistake from our end, then this is a matter of great trustworthiness. It is a great treasure, and we should disseminate this knowledge. Both the attitudes are completely natural, 
when the warning would be given with this intensity, the careful people would show this tendency, and the people who understand the worth of that knowledge may develop the other tendency too. Everybody realizes its worth, however, as they feel answerable to God. Hence, the companions or the renowned companions exercised extraordinary caution. When we look at the people of the other point of view, we learn that those who are called muksirin, that is, they reported narrations on a large scale. So, who were among them? Look, at the top, the list is Abu Huraira, may God be pleased with him. Regarding him, we have said earlier, he would put his excuse that he feared the whip in the times of Umar, may God be pleased with him. However, that fear is no more so, I am stating it. This implies that he had a certain viewpoint in this regard, on which he would insist upon. He has reported a lot of narrations. Following him is the name of the son of Caliph Umar, Abdullah bin Umar. His narrations are there. Post this is Anas bin Malik. Following him is Ibn Abbas, Abdullah bin Abbas. He is one of the scholars among the companions. Since he has to educate the learners, the people also frequent to him, and his status is that of a big scholar. Hence, he might have needed to narrate too. Then comes Jabir bin Abdullah, Abu Sa'id Khudri, may God be pleased with them, and Umm al-Mu'mineen Sayyida Aisha herself. Her narrations form large number. After her is Abdullah bin Amr bin As. We have discussed about him that he used to write too, and he was stopped later on, followed by Raif bin Khadij and Bara bin Azib. These are the people about whom is said Aksaru Sahabati Hadisan. These are the people who reported narrations on a large scale. It becomes clear from this that on one side are the people who are of the opinion that this knowledge should reach the people as much as possible. And on the other hand are the companions who exercised extraordinary caution. And I have presented to you the reasons for their extreme caution. Albeit, we were entering the period when a large number of followers had taken birth. Followers were born in the family of the companions too, that is, the people among their children who had taken birth after the Prophet's departure from the world, they were their followers too. And newer Muslims were also entering the fold by looking at them. A number of scholars were also present among the companions. Like some people in every society choose to study a certain science for their expertise, and they are then referred to. Exactly the same happened with the companions too. The companions had spread out to some great centers, so we see that such scholarly circles started coming into existence. That is, if you wish to ascertain, it can be said that in the second half of the first century, the circles started coming into existence where the companions used to teach the people, a chain of learning and teaching had begun. Now whatever was there was entering into the world of academics. One was that the Qur'an was being stated after the departure of the Prophet, or the recitation of the Qur'an was being done, or the Qur'an was being preserved. So this is being done by the entire Muslim community or the group of the Muslims. But now the scholarly circles are coming into existence. Here we see that as they already existed in Medina, some companions formed those circles in Makkah too as well as in Kufa, Syria, Egypt, and Basra in Iraq. These became the centers of learning for the Muslims. As companions reached these places, they would proceed to mosque, and people would gather around them. So, the way they learned the Qur'an from them, hence, whatever we see with regard to the exegesis of the Qur'an, as it was stated by followers, and they are the first to be stated in Tabari, etc., those had been learned in those very circles, where they were educated and learned through the companions. Like the Qur'an was being taught and learned, likewise the knowledge of the Prophet, peace be upon him, would also be discussed. That is, if someone inquires of something, or some issue is at hand, or some companion has stated it of his own, then the scholarly circles, or in a way, a kind of unconventional, Dar ul Hadis or House of Hadis started coming into existence. In these places in mosques, the systematic establishment of Madaris schools did not take place. However, the people would go to the mosques, they would go on someday, and sit in the Jama Mosque as per their convenience, like we would see later, 
how Imam Malik had taught hadith sitting in the Prophet's mosques. So such circles started to come into existence. Okay. This happened in the second half of the first century. When these circles came into existence, like there had been ulema among the companions, similarly, scholars came up among the followers. So academics was their real occupation. So some among them were learning the Quran or some were learning hadith. So now the hadith started reaching people with specialization. The knowledge which the Prophet had left behind or had said something about his seerah had till now been a traditional knowledge communicated to the people in an unconventional manner. Now its seekers had grown in a rather orderly fashion. That is, the seekers of knowledge who would travel to different places, would attend the gatherings of the companions, and teacher-student relationships started growing between them. I am presenting a list of those people to you, which would provide to you an idea that now such scholars had started growing in large numbers. That is, just guess that this was the time when people were learning from the companions. Among them were Ibn Shihab Zuhri, who was among the renowned followers, the freed slave of Ibn Abbas, Ikrama, and there is Caliph Umar bin Abdul Aziz. Really? He is among the followers, a great taba'i. Kabul Ahbar, Wahab bin Munabbe, Sa'id bin Musayyib, Urwah bin Zubair, Nafe. He is the freed slave of Ibn Umar, the freed slave of Abdullah bin Umar. He is the same Nafe, about which is said that if Nafe is reporting from Ibn Umar, and that reporting reaches Imam Malik, and An Malik An Nafe An Ibn Umar, this is a golden chain. Likewise, Ubaidullah bin Abdullah, and likewise is Salim bin Abdullah, who is the son of Abdullah bin Umar, and likewise is Shabi, Ibrahim Naqwi, and Al Qama. These are the renowned followers who are now narrating hadith in the capacity of ulema. Ghamdi Sahab, hadith is the history of the times of the Prophet, of his life and biography, and of his knowledge and deeds. And what is its own history? Starting from the times of the Prophet till the times of the companions, we studied the attitude of the Rashidun Caliphs and three fundamental questions. We paused on all three, investigated each of them in the context of the corpus we possessed from the past. The point of view of Khamdi Sahab comes forth. We shall carry along with this discussion, that is, what followed after the times of the companions. We are run out of time right now. We shall be at your service once again. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much.